please be seated. What a week, no? First, the Supreme Court upheld the Affordable Care Act, preserving affordable health care for millions of people. Then, in news that came to me as I was getting ready to preside at the Convention Eucharist on Friday, the court made marriage equality the law of the land. And then, in a eulogy for the Reverend Clementa Pinckney and eight other martyrs of Mother Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church of Charleston, South Carolina, and in the midst of unspeakable pain and grief of the terrorism of racism, the President of the United States, the first black President of the United States, gave to anyone who had ears to hear a fuller understanding of the grace of God and named the Confederate flag for what it is, a symbol of institutionalized racism and hate. And I haven't even gotten to what the Episcopal Church meeting in its 78th General Convention has done. By the time this church got to Saturday, God's Holy Spirit was more than ready to bust us apart so that we could see clearly where we are united. We elected Michael Bruce Curry, our next presiding bishop. Yes, he's the first African-American presiding bishop-elect of the Episcopal Church, and yes, the election on the first ballot was rare, if not unprecedented, but more importantly, Bishop Curry knows what all means. Yeah. Michael Curry is a man who has walked humbly with God all his life. He knows out of his own experience the debilitating power of the evil of racism and the subtle perniciousness of words that divide. And he knows the deep, reconciling, all-powerful love of God, and no one can keep him from singing it. <laughs> then yesterday, Sunday morning, Many of us got up out of bed very early to march against gun violence and what presiding bishop-elect Curry calls the unholy trinity of racism, poverty, and gun violence. As a church, we demonstrated that we can do as well as debate. In addition to tongues, we have legs and wheels, and we need to use both. And now, here we all are, celebrating the Integrity Eucharist for the first time ever in the official convention worship space. Thank you. And we're not done yet. The president of the House of Deputies said in her excellent sermon on Friday that translation is an important part of the work we are called to do, translating great and glorious visions into concrete reality. I'd like to add to that. I believe that redefining is also an important part of the work we are called to do, as in redefining marriage. And I think we got to this point of redefining marriage by redefining two other very common words, home and family. Let me tell you what I mean. 
One of the most memorable courses I took in high school was entitled The Epic. What made it so exciting for me was reading both the Iliad and the Odyssey, the two major epics of Greek antiquity. I didn't just read them. I hungrily devoured them, learning all I could about the striking characters, fiery passions, and intricate plots so elaborately worked out in the metrical verse form we know as dactylic hexameter. <laughs> I remember well my English teacher speaking enthusiastically about Odysseus, the hero of the Odyssey. Odysseus was the king of Ithaca, married to the beautiful and faithful Penelope. Odysseus had never wanted to go with his fellow Greeks to Troy to fight a war. In fact, at first, Odysseus refused to accompany the Greeks to Troy, feigning madness by sowing his own fields with salt. But the Greeks placed his son, Telemachus in front of the plow, and Odysseus was compelled to admit his ruse and join the invading army. The Trojan War lasted 10 years, and it takes Odysseus another 10 years to travel home to Ithaca. His journey home and the many exciting adventures and dangers he faces in the course of his journey are the subject of the Odyssey. The opening scenes depict the disorder that has arisen in Odysseus' household during his long absence. A band of suitors is devouring his property as they woo his wife, Penelope. Then the epic shifts to Odysseus, who during his travels faces such dangers as the man-eating giant Polyphemus and such subtler threats as the goddess Calypso, who offers him immortality if he will abandon his quest for home. The second half of the epic begins with Odysseus's arrival at his home island of Ithaca. There, exercising infinite patience and self-control, Odysseus tests the loyalty of his servants, plots and carries out a bloody revenge on Penelope's suitors and is reunited with his son, his faithful wife, and his aged father. It's stunning. What a story. And my English teacher pointed to Odysseus as an example par excellence of a hero who embodied two great dynamics of human existence. The desire to leave home and have adventures, and the longing to return home and be complete. I guess I really related to that. While I hadn't faced man-eating giants or goddesses, darn it, that <laughs> promised me immortality if I abandoned home, I had felt the thrill of being independent from my parents, the risk of doing things I had never done before, and I was looking forward to going to college. On the other hand, after a long hot week working as a summer camp counselor with 100 screaming kids, I also enjoyed coming home for my day off returning to a place that was safe, where I could rest, eat, sleep, and gear up for the next week at camp. Home, the dictionary says, the place where one lives, the fixed residence of a family or household, a dwelling house, the place where one's family is. I did enjoy coming home. When we look at scripture, we might want to ask, where is home for Jesus? By tradition, he was born in Bethlehem and grew up in Nazareth. In tonight's gospel, 
we read that Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. But in Mark's gospel, there are times when Jesus is at home and his family travels to see him, or really to attempt to protect him from his critics. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus' family seems to have come to him, even though he is apparently at home. The Greek says, literally, that Jesus comes into a house. But the word used for house, oikos, usually implies a family, and thus where one's family lives. When we do a, a little research on that text, we realize that geographically, Jesus is doing his teaching and preaching and much of his healing neither in Bethlehem, where he was traditionally born, nor in Nazareth, where he grew up, but rather in Capernaum, a city on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. In fact, it turns out that Capernaum is the only place in the Gospels of which it is said that Jesus was at home. And we might remember further that when Jesus does go back to his hometown of Nazareth, he and his preaching are rejected there, causing Jesus to comment, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. So where is home for Jesus? You know, it's pretty difficult to say. Beyond Bethlehem, Nazareth, and Capernaum, Jesus wandered with a group of disciples all over the countryside. Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, Jesus said. His followers left their homes too to follow him. Yet it doesn't mean that home is not important to Jesus. He tells of coming home in the parable of the prodigal son. He visits Bethany quite frequently, the home of his dear friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He appears to create homes away from home in the places where he does stay. And he shows a reverence for and love of Jerusalem and the temple, the home base of his people. Even at his death on the cross, he reaches back to the earliest biblical language about home, saying to the penitent thief, truly I tell you, this day you will be with me in paradise. And along those same lines, in the fourth gospel, he tells his disciples, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. For Jesus, home meant many things. He was born in Bethlehem, grew up in Nazareth, at home in Capernaum. He left home to bring forward the reign of God, to confront demons and exorcise them, to preach, teach, and heal people of their diseases and brokenness, and to show people a much more tangible and concrete way to be with God. Because ultimately, home for Jesus was not so much a where as a when. Home for Jesus was when he was with God. And that seemed to be, in some way, all the time. 
Yet there was still a sense in which Jesus and all of scripture made a distinction between a temporal earthly home and an eternal home with God. The writer of the fourth gospel in describing the Last Supper puts it this way. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. Home. Here is a second question. What is family for Jesus? If by the word family we mean a set of parents and children or of relations living together or not, then Jesus' family really doesn't fare too well in most parts of scripture. There's that section in Mark's gospel where, when Jesus is at home in Capernaum and we read, then his mother and his brothers came and standing outside they sent and called him. A crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and your sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. People are saying that Jesus is out of his mind, so Jesus is family goes out to restrain him. They do not grasp who he is or that his ministry is from God. Jesus' own family are not, or at least not yet, among his disciples. The gospel writer Mark has already suggested that Jesus has moved away from his natural family by letting us know that it's Peter's house in Capernaum to which Jesus comes home after preaching in surrounding areas. But five different times Mark names mother and brothers and sisters as if to make sure his readers understand just what family he's talking about. And what Jesus says is, here are my mother and brothers. He looks around at the crowd gathered there, eager to hear his words, and says, whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The concept of family is transformed. The reign of God transcends even the closest of family ties. Imagine Jesus right here, right now, with us. He's here. His blood family is trying to protect him. They send a messenger, and he looks around at all of us and says to the messenger, waving his arm around to indicate us, here are my mother and brothers and sisters. Here they are. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. My friends, consider this. What does it mean for us to be Jesus' brother or sister or mother? I would venture to guess that many of us have thought of ourselves as brothers and sisters of Jesus, but what about being Jesus' mother? What does it mean for us to parent and nurture the word of God in the world? For Jesus, family was not as much a who as it was a whoever. Family, for Jesus, was whoever did the will of God, his disciples, present, and future. This presents a challenge to the church. The word family, even in early 21st century United States, seems to indicate a closed system of blood-related and possibly adopted people. For that reason, some say family is not a good analogy for parishes. 
We must continually struggle with this tension. Do we really welcome the stranger? Is it possible to be close-knit, yet so hospitable that others will want to join us in God's mission in the world? It's interesting to note in this part of Mark's gospel that we've been talking about that the member of Jesus' natural family who is most clearly missing is his father, Joseph. Commentators conjecture that Joseph died when Jesus was very young. That may certainly be the case, but a more important thing, I believe, is being said ever so subtly, and it is that all of us, Jesus, his brothers, his sisters, his mother, have one and the same Father who is God. Can we, the church, really be Jesus' family? We need to understand that Jesus' family does not look like our own blood-related and adopted families. Jesus' family has all sorts of weird and wonderful, broken and diseased people in it. Jesus' family is born through the waters of baptism and nourished by Jesus' own blood. This family may not be what we expect. About a week before I left my hometown to go off to college for the first time, Bets McCollum, my best friend's mother, took me aside for a few words of advice. Mrs. McCollum was a heavy drinker, a constant smoker, and someone who seemed to know all about the ways of the world, ways that I wasn't too clear about, but that seemed vaguely appealing to me. <laughs> I loved her because she acted so cool with us kids, really with it and up to date. And I knew she loved her children, not just her own four children, of whom my best friend was the youngest, but all of us kids in the neighborhood. Mary, she said to me in her husky voice, piercing me with her dark eyes, I'm not going to make a speech because I want you to remember this, so I'll keep it short. Study first and party later. Don't get pregnant. Nope, no problem there. And, and if you ever get in serious trouble, I mean the kind you can't tell your parents about, call me and I'll come running. And then, as if to drive the point home, she pressed a dime in my hand and said, you can call Colette. Here's a dime for the operator. <laughs> and I knew as I left home that my family had grown. Leaving home, returning home, Odysseus, Jesus, and us. Jesus redefined both home and family. Home is not so much where as when we're with God. Family is not so much who as whoever does the will of God, which still leaves us with this adventure we call life. It is God's gift to us. It's the journey from God and to God. It's everything we do and all who we are from birth to death and beyond, including fighting man-eating giants and facing those who would seduce us away from the great adventure. It's rage and grief and joy and wonder and sorrow and hope and love. It's marrying the person we love and are committed to and want to spend our entire lives with. It's leaving home and returning home with smokers and drinkers and priests and sinners and saints, with family, at home. Jesus was right. The Apostle Paul was right. You are right, Louis Clu Cray, Clay Clue. Faith, <laughs> hope, and love abide 
but the greatest of these is love. Amen. Amen.